Well, well, well. Howdy, howdy. So I wanted to talk to you today about 65. I had a chance to play uh, today at lunch for uh, about an hour and a half or two hours. It took, it took a fair while to play the scenario, actually, uh, which is interesting in of itself. So I'm assuming that most of you know Mark Walker and the uh, Flying Pig War Games company, and they make uh, you know some pretty pretty solid games. And I've been curious about this particular title, and I didn't actually uh, play my copy. Uh, I, Mark sent me a copy to uh, check out, and I haven't had a chance to break the shrink on it yet. So um, I played with my friend's copy, and uh, he's played three or four times, so he kind of guided me through the rules a little bit. And it was all pretty straightforward, because it feels very much like Night of Man, but obviously with a different context and a different theme. So let's go through a few bits and pieces and we'll talk about the game and how the game plays and stuff like that. So we got, you know, we got your box art. Uh, it's a fantastic, sturdy, good box, good looking box, nice artwork, beautiful. Uh, we have very sexy, large counters and by comparison, let me just grab, you know what, actually, and by coincidence, Happen to have a lock, a lock and load uh, counter here. This is actually Jeff Newell's counter uh, that uh, he put on my map board in Seattle, and now I own it. Uh, and then a regular counter for you know your standard SPI game. So you can see the the huge counters, and the artwork is is pretty exceptional on them. I'm not going to mess around with focusing. There's lots of videos out on shrink rips if you want to want to get into all the components, which are, I would say generally speaking first class. Uh, they are uh, thick, sturdy, high quality, high quality maps, no bends, no warps. And I think that's one thing that perhaps Mark has uh, quite possibly overemphasized here because in the past, he'd, when he owned Lock and Load, I think he got a lot of grief for particularly the World of War series for the, the warping maps because it was kind of that foamy sort of stiff board that would warp easily. And uh, you've got a lot of grief for, uh, particularly from some of the folks in Seattle, from you know, you know the, the color tones on uh, various bits and pieces of the game. So you know, US green was not always US green. It would often change from module to module by a significant number of shades. And so I think in this instance, uh, Flying Pig's games have gone to an, an extraordinary length to make sure that the components are absolutely 100% first class. And they are. So, um, not going to pull everything out of the box. You don't need to see the maps. The maps are gorgeous, and you, like I said, you can see all that stuff elsewhere. Uh, there's lots of guys doing shrink rips and things these days. <clears throat> so, what about the game and the, the rule book, history, things like that? So, having read through the rule book and having played many of uh, 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 tactical games in the past and indeed many of Mike Walker's games in the past, there were many concepts in it that were very familiar. Uh, and in fact, there were, very, there were a lot of concepts, concepts that were familiar uh, from uh, Combat Commander, uh, Conflict of Heroes, and to a certain extent, Lock and Load. Uh, terminology is similar. If you're a Lock and Load player or a World of War player, uh, you will understand what Ops Complete means. You won't understand what Ops Complete means if you read the rule book, because it's not mentioned in the rule book what Ops Complete actually means. It's a term that's used, and there are counters for it, uh, but they're not, it's not defined. And so that, that is kind of a strange miss for me, that the core terms are missed. Uh, similarly, there's no range for the sniper. And when we went to play with the sniper, and we end up getting on BGG to find out that snipers uh, don't have a range. Um, I thought we could tell. Uh, so it's unlimited. And then there's uh, the uh, fire and move cards, which say you may uh, move half and then fire. So it's kind of like in uh, many games, you can m move half your movement rate and then shoot, which is cool. Uh, you can do the same thing here. But this has the word may on it, and that means you don't have to. You may move and fire. You may move and not fire. You may fire and not move. So I'm reading it, that's what it says. But apparently that's not what it means. So that's different, which is 
once again, it's just that's so that's two little things that I find that are put a lot of time into this. The game took a long time to get out. Lots of production challenges, I'm sure, or whatever the reasoning is. But let's get the you know let's get the clarity of the rules right because this is not a complex game. It's 19, I want to say 19 pages of rules, maybe. It's because it's got all the scenarios in the back. Um, and we'll talk about the scenarios and all that sort of stuff in a minute. Yeah, so 19 pages of rules, including the front front cover. Actually, no, it's not including front cover. Yeah, so it is flat out 19 pages. <clears throat> so it's a very clean, very straightforward uh, game. It's just not a complex game to play. Uh, but it does take a long time to play, which is interesting. Uh, we, you, basically, here's how it works. You, get, you have these cards, right? And uh, to give you a quick little rundown. Uh, you have cards that will, uh, a hand of four that you start with and you use one card to bid uh, your initiative and there's a number down here on this side and whoever has the highest number, they get to go first. That card is discarded and put into uh, the discard pile and the person who lost the initiative bid, they get their card back and it goes into their hand. So the person who's starting with the initiative starts with three cards to play and then uh, and then the next person goes and he has four cards that he can play. Not that he'll play all four, he's gonna play one action at a time. He may use additional cards for supporting action like uh, a critical hit, uh, anything with a yellow dot on it on the, on the card uh, up here, see? That's a supporting action versus a, a red action, uh, which is a different type, which is either a move or a, a fire or the case may be. So um, red and green actions are the uh, things that you can do per se. Uh, so then you, you play an action, you either fire or you move or you do something. Uh, you may play a card for artillery or something like that. Uh, if you play an end of turn card, then that goes straight into the discard pile and, or to the side. And when you get three of those, and there's four in the deck, when you get three of those and the turn is over, so it adds an element of chance and randomness to your uh, turn length, which is quite interesting and fun. <coughs> Because as uh, sometimes as the defender, you're wishing for those uh, those end of turn cards. So you play these straight away. As soon as you get them, you play them, and then you get another card in, in, as a replacement. Uh, so that you'll you'll play your things, you'll you'll move and you'll uh, shoot and do things. Uh, the counters have, uh, while they're large, they do have a lot of information on them. It's kind of cool. So you've got these little icons uh, here and here, and those icons are going to represent different abilities or perhaps different skills. So this little girl here, she's got a whole bunch of different skills. She's got a sniper skill, excuse me, and uh, she has, uh, she's tough. Uh, she'll, uh, there's a, in the rules, you gotta look in the rules, there's no chart for this, unfortunately, but there's a set of abilities here and you can look up the abilities and know what they mean and, and go for it. I think someone created a, a Board Game Geek chart, so we use that because you don't wanna be diving in the rule book all the time for a simple game. So you get in, you've got these leader counters and squads and you kind of goof around and you move and do stuff and uh, achieve the objectives of the scenario. So all in all, the game played uh, played simply. So you, you would uh, look at what you had in your hand. You may not be able to do anything. So in a sort of combat commander style way, you're kind of stuck, but you can discard a couple of cards and, uh, and then uh, pick up. And you may be, you know, then maybe you can play or whatever the case may be. So what I do like though, is that nine times out of 10, you will be able to do something with your cards because there are, I think there's 12 fire cards out of the 54 and there's four fire and move cards. So you've got a 30% chance of being able to uh, uh, fire. Uh, I didn't count how many move cards there were because there's a whole different, there's a whole swag of different types of movement uh, available to you. Uh, so, yeah, so there was just some common sense that things here that are just missing in terms of organization and charts and structure and things like that, which just made it, you know, a little bit frustrating. Um, same deal uh, in terms of killing something. So you might say, well, gee, you know, how do you kill stuff, Kevin? Well, that's pretty straightforward too. Uh, you've got on these cards, which are so dual purpose, right? So you pull them all from the same deck. Uh, you can see that has a uh, green hit number here, right? That, uh, when you're playing with infantry, that green hit number, is there one there? Yep, that green hit number there, 
that means that you, uh, you've uh, scored a hit and you work out what your hit strength is, what your firing strength is. Where's a decent dude? Here's a dude with a, a strength of two there, right? So he's gonna go and try and fire it at someone who's in a building. That building's gonna give a defensive value of one. So this goes down to two and you might have a range benefit or that person may have moved and so they will get plus one or plus one for the move or plus one because of the range and you might go up to two. Nine times out of 10 you, uh, from the gameplay I've had and, what, and the three or four times my friends played, you're gonna end up with a strength of one or two, which simply means you draw one or two cards to see whether or not you get that hit. And now there's, uh, I did some math, uh, and it's my math, so it may not be right. Uh, I did, there are 60, you have a 64% chance of getting a hit. Uh, well, there's 35 cards that have a green hit on it. Nine times out of 10, that's the type of hit you're trying to achieve uh, when you're firing weapons, ranged weapons. This, this excludes melee and stuff like that. So uh, there's a reasonably good chance you're gonna get a hit. Now, one hit will shake, one hit will uh, second hit will uh, reduce it and the third hit will kill it. So it's the standard uh, kind of mechanic that Mark Walker has used in the past for other games and that many other games use. So that's fair enough. And once you're shaken, there's very little you can do. You flip the, you put a, a shaking counter on it and you're, you uh, flip your unit over for the reduced value and, and away you go, you keep playing. Um, it has opportunity fire. It has, uh, I'm just looking down here on my list. Uh, and really simple and very cool artillery uh, me mechanic. So for mortars or artillery, you, you draw the card, you play the card, you point to a line of sight that tells you how many, um, how many, how many, and then how many cards you're going to get with the strength. You know, adjust it for terrain, pull the cards, you're done. And then you can also uh, pick an additional hex in it that's adjacent to uh, be attacked as well. So very very straightforward. Uh, I like the, uh, I really like the, uh, the the fact that after you've moved and fired, there are cards in the deck here. If I can find one real quick, uh, so I can I, I can recover during the turn. Uh, if I'm shaken, I can play a rally card, and that will make my unit ops complete instead of shaken, which is a good thing. Uh, you can uh, play cards here that's somewhere here that will, and I can't find my right off the top of the bat. Here we go, uh, second wind. Remove, um, remove a fired or a moved marker so that you can actually get another action in the turn. So perhaps if someone's doing real well, you want to advance them into a victory hex, whatever the case may be, uh, your opponent thinks they're, that you're done there and bam, you play this card and surprise, surprise, they get to sneak in and, uh, and uh, secure the objective or maybe go into Malay or whatever the case may be. So that worked, that all works real well. So it gives it a much more dynamic gameplay than perhaps a standard uh, tactical game where you everybody moves or you go through this alternating thing where it's you move, you fire, I move, you move and all that sort of stuff where you may uh, move and fire with the dude or you may move with the dude and then you think he's done but really is not. The only way a unit is ever done in this game for the turn is if it has an obstacle complete marker on it, and uh, hence my earlier comment about that not being defined in the rules. It's a big mess, should have been in the rules because it makes sense to me, I know what that means, but I've played Walker's games before. If you haven't played before, uh, you wouldn't know that. I'd say this is absolutely definitely a, a light tactical game. There's not a lot of tactics gonna be explored here because of the way the maps are structured, unless you're putting two maps side by side or two length, you know, two uh, adjacent to whatever the case may be, uh, end to end is what I'm trying to say, because it's only eight hexes wide. So there's not, uh, and the, the movement rates, there's not a lot of moving, uh, uh, maneuvering, I guess, can happen in this game. Uh, there are flanking fire cards that you can play. There are bullet storm style cards you can play that can enhance your fire combat, but this is not something you can plan on, and nor is it something that in, in a, uh, you know, ASL style way that you're gonna, you know, get uh, converging angles of fire and do that. So if you play ASL and you want something like Uber Light that's lighter than Combat Commander, 
uh, and uh, in that vein, then yeah, this is probably a fun game for you to try. If you want super historical scenarios, I, yeah, I, I kind of read through the scenarios and we played this one. It, it, you know, someone was, I don't know, someone was posting online some video about his, historicity. Uh, whether or not it has supernatural animals and it, it's got nothing to do with the fucking game. Uh, whoop. Pardon me. It has nothing to do with the game at all. We all know Mark likes supernatural, supernatural stuff, but this has got nothing to do with that. And uh, nowhere does it say anything about that, so that's irrelevant and it doesn't make this game historical. What makes the game historical is are we looking at scenarios from a given period of time with the right weapons platforms and the right weapons and perhaps some battles that were fought uh, or an action from those battles that's representative. And uh, in this, I think you've got uh, uh, you know eight fairly generic scenarios that cover your typical, like a meeting engagement, uh, an ambush, a convoy, uh, taking the village, defending the village type of thing. So you've got those types of things. Uh, Lots of vehicles, and that's one thing that I would say in terms of history, maybe that's not so accurate because I don't know that you know there were platoons of M48s driving around mowing down stuff, and I don't know that uh, there are actually units in here that have no scenario uh, use. I don't know why they're there. Uh, is it to roll complete an OB or something like that? I'm, I'm confused about that. Uh, there's no Arvin in the game. Uh, the, the city scenario. The city scenario. There's one city scenario with some sort of follow-on bit for it, uh, and a beautiful city map, huge city map, gorgeous. But there's one scenario, and I, I'm like, what? what happened? I know scenarios are hard to make and take time, and you've got to be tested and all the rest of it, which kind of brings me to another point. I think. It's, there were very few playtesters on this. If I look at the list, maybe there were more that just weren't credited, but uh, it's a very, very small playtest group here that uh, I think with, uh, uh, you know, probably a, a Mark Walker style person telling you how to play the game, this is where some of these little things like uh, Ops Complete and Sniper Ranges and mo things about movement, there was some, there's a long two and a half page FAQ for the rules clarifications. I think there's uh, some things, opportunities were missed that people didn't read the rules and go, hey, what does this mean? Or why isn't this included? Or whatever that case may be. So all that aside, I still think that you could get this game and play it. I, 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 it's kind of, uh, it's fun. It's a fun game to play, but I had a hard time getting connected to the units because I had no real control over them. Same same sort of issue you would have with Combat Command, I guess, to a certain extent. They said here you have more control, but your 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 firepower comes down to where nearly every combat's a one or a two. So you draw one card or two cards, and you know I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a hit, but am I gonna do anything else to that that unit that turn? Um, and that it made it hard for me to try and. Uh, sort of get engaged in the game and it took a long time to play. I would expect for a game of this magnitude, I mean, look at the, there's a, oh God, there's a box full of goodies in here, right? Lots and lots of counters, lots and lots of stuff, lots of cards, you know, this is a light game. I would expect it to play faster uh, and, and a little more seamlessly, but you know, we were still constantly you know, looking, well, what do these activity mobility things do? And, uh, uh, you know, checking bits and pieces in the charts. Uh, it just, it, I kind of struggled with connecting with the game. But like I said, I had fun, pardon me, I had fun. But I don't know that it's, it's the tactical game. In fact, I know it's not the tactical game, right? Just gonna put that out there. But it's a fun game. If you're looking for something light and uh, I almost said fast playing because it's not fast playing. Uh, uh, if you're looking for something light that's a distraction, I think this is a good game to play. I would like, I would have liked to have seen the Arvin included, less vehicles, the scenarios for all the units that are available or combinations of them in some way, shape or form. And uh, one thing that, you know what's lacking? You know what it is? When, when Mark did uh, 
those lock and load modules, the Forgotten Heroes and uh, Ring of Hills and Day of Heroes, you, you were immersed in this, the, the snippet of the story and, and, and the historicity that you felt like you were doing something. Like the battle for Mogadishu, all that, Day of Heroes, you're there. But not only that, the, the scenarios are so finely tuned that either through victory conditions or force ballots, that it's a knife edge game the whole way and you are always thinking you're either just about to win or just about to lose. I didn't get that with this. And I was kind of, ex- I really was expecting that because I think one of, the, one of the biggest strengths of Mark Walker's games are the, the scenario design, the level of effort that he puts into those, those scenarios uh, has always been a hallmark for me of his capability as a game designer. And I think that's, uh, that's not as prevalent here. I'm not saying the scenarios aren't good. I'm just saying they're not as good as I've experienced in the past. So um, there are some other cool little uh, features that I think are, are you know, whether, the, you know, the, big, the biggest thing that I think that is, is neat and cool is the, the capabilities let me just turn this so you can see. These these capabilities or abilities of the different units are, uh, are a very clever idea. It's a way to give a unit differentiation uh, a whole new level of uh, meaning and capability in a game that's, uh, that makes it uh, really shine for me. It makes it more fun and, and more engaging. Uh, there are these other alternate victory conditions cards where you get uh, VPs for doing other things in a given scenario. And every scenario you will get one or maybe more, as the case may be. And uh, that adds a depth uh, to the game as well because you've got this hidden objective thing, kind of like with uh, Combat Commander and there's some other, com- other games to do that. But that with the abilities and the card play, I think really gives this a relatively unique feel but it's very clearly borrowing from other systems and then melded together with, uh, with very, very high quality components. So there you have it. That's my first impression, first gameplay. Uh, taking a lot of feedback also from the folks who've uh, played previously from uh, this one chap, buddy of mine, who I play with on a regular basis. <coughs> um, I, I would probably say you, the, the biggest surprise to me was the slowness of the of you know, how long it took us to get through a game. Uh, I've played I've played lock and load scenarios that play faster than this, so it's an interesting interesting situation, and and I'm kind of uh, kind of would like to have seen more more hexes long and wide uh, to allow a little bit more maneuver or whatever the case may be, so that I felt like I was. You know, who am I in the game, right? Am I the commander or am I just moving some squads around and doing some stuff? And I think we're moving some squads around and doing some stuff. I'm not sure that I'm the platoon commander or whatever the case may be because there's no real benefit to making those maneuver style actions uh, in the game. Anyway, you can see there's 90 man up in the corner there. Uh, that's another, uh, you know, the very, it's a similar system, but it's been tweaked obviously for Vietnam. And I think, I think it works. I'm just not sure that uh, it was what I was expecting out of the box. Uh, we'll have played a few more times, see how it goes, maybe try some vehicles and stuff, and uh, see if we can't dig into some of these other scenarios and maybe they'll be a little more tense and uh, a little more grouping type of thing. All right, guys, I'm gonna let you go. Talk to you soon.